Thank you so much for joining me in the Louis file. This is going to be a part two coming out of Romans 7. Uh, the first part we covered, we read the first five verses and we uh, pulled that apart a little bit. I would hope that you'd go back and watch that first video. Today we're going to move on into verse 6 and 7 of Romans 7 and see what we can get into. So if you have your Bible, jump on in with me in Romans 7, verse 6 and 7. All right, let me just say this. Last week we discovered that we were joined to a husband and uh, we couldn't get free from him unless he died, but the, the truth is we, we had to die. You know, the believer is the uh, female in this illustration and, and through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we have died and been raised back, joined to another. So now Christ himself, God, can produce his fruit in our life, whereas we used to be fruit, uh, fruit bearers or uh, we were getting uh, sinful passions were at work in our flesh and we bore fruit for death. Now we don't have to do that anymore. Now we have life coming through because we have a new producer in us. So go back and watch that video and uh, maybe you can catch up with us on this one. In Romans 7 verse 6 he says, But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. Wow. So he, so Paul's telling us that we're not a flesh person trying to keep a, uh, the commandments of the law. We are now a spirit person, and we're operating according to a new source. We have a new life producer in us. Whereas we used to be sin-operated, now we're righteousness-operated. Back in Romans 6, it said we're either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. As a believer and a receiver of Jesus Christ, he is Mr. Righteousness, and he is now living our lives. He, he is our life, according to Colossians. He's not just giving us life. He's not, he's not just a part of our life. He's not just a priority in our life. The fact is, he is our life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no one comes to the Father but by Him. And, and that this is eternal life, that they might know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And in 1 John, it says, He that has the Son has the life. He that doesn't have the Son doesn't have the life. So <laughs> we can go on and on. <laughs> but Jesus Christ, by way of the Holy Spirit moving into us, is now our life. We used to uh, live according to the flesh because that's all we knew. And even as a person that is attempting to do the right thing, as we say, or good things, or wanting to do what God told us to do, we couldn't do them because our flesh absolutely cannot uh, do anything in order to please God. Because it, it, He's spirit and He's seeking those that worship in spirit and truth. And, and the fact is, I'll let you in on a little secret, that Christ in us, has to be the one to live our lives if we ever think we're going to be pleasing to God. And that's where we're heading in Romans 8, but we got quite the journey to get there, so I hope that you will continue uh, and join me through this little trip through Romans 7. It's, it's uh, tough waiting at times, but I hope I can make it clear for you. Romans 7, uh, verse 7 then, the question the Apostle Paul brings this up. He says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. So the Apostle Paul is he's walking us through what this looks like. God's law is not sin. So, but at the same time, it's pointing out something that's sinful in him, and, and he names it coveting. You know, uh, the law here, Paul gets very specific, and he, he, he points to the tenth commandment. We have ten commandments. He points to number ten, thou shalt not covet. And he says that's the one that he's going to focus on, and he names it. That's what, that's what I think is so great here, because so many... I've heard people say, Father, forgive us of our many sins. Now, I don't think that a, a blanket uh, request for forgiveness is what God is after. You know, the Apostle Paul is telling us here that coveting was his problem, and, he, and he's going to aim at that. He's going to call it what it is, and he's going to show us how the law 
uh, applies to all this. So he's saying the law itself is not sin because it, it revealed to him what sin was. He, he came to know that coveting was not right because of the law. So it pointed out something was wrong in him. And he would have not understood at all that coveting was wrong or even that what coveting was without it. So that's a good thing. But, but look what happens here. Romans 7, 8, But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin, by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. <laughs> so the law is serving a great purpose, but it is painful as it can be. The law is there to point out sin. You know, back in Romans 5, 20, it says the law came in so that the transgression would increase. Oh my gosh. So why God gave the law appears to be something completely different than what the average person ever even dreams up. Because the average person comes into the church or starts to attempt to read the Bible or understand God or get their life straight for some reason or the other, and when they do, they see these commandments on the walls of our buildings and in our yards, and they think, well, that's, that's what we are supposed to do. So they set about trying to stop stealing, or they try to stop lying, or, or coveting, or committing adultery, or they all, you know, we got to put God first. We can't have anything before God. That's so we look at all these commandments and we think we can actually perform up to their standard when that's not at all why God gave them. That is not the reason he gave the law. And that's what I hope for you to see in these few videos I'm doing. Let's back up a second and let's just touch on a little bit more about what Romans, the Apostle Paul tells us and reveals to us about the law. Romans 3, verse 19 and 20. These verses are amazing. Romans 3, 19 and 20 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God, because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So, what can we get from this? Paul's telling us very clearly what the law is about, and it, it's given to shut our mouths, hold us accountable, and to give us knowledge of sin. So when we look at the law, we should go, oh, that's me, I broke those laws. Oh my gosh, that's sin? See, it was there to, to make us accountable, to point out sin, and then like I said a minute ago in Romans 5, it says the law is actually brought in so that the sin or the transgression would increase, it would be even worse. So in Romans 7, the Apostle Paul is showing us, he says, I wouldn't even know what coveting was if the law didn't tell me to stop it or not do it. So the law itself is good because it's pointing out the problem. <laughs> but the law in and of itself is not something we can do. We can't perform up to its perfect standards. And the Apostle Paul says, every time I tried to stop coveting, I saw that coveting was wrong because of the law, and then I set out trying not to covet. Sin took advantage of me, took an opportunity because of the law, and produced in me more coveting. The second that I saw, do not walk on the grass, I had to go get on top of that grass. <laughs> the minute I saw the sign on the wall that said, wet paint, don't touch, I had to go over there and touch it. See, the law, the commandment, brings that out in us. It brings it out. So in Romans 6, we're told uh, that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have died to sin. But without dying to law, is what we're looking at now in Romans 7, without seeing that we have been set free from law, also sin, even though we died to it, will take advantage of us because we're not really getting it. We, we're still now attempting to live as if we in our flesh can do things to please God. We can stop this and start that. It's really just a result of the fall of man to begin with in the garden, which is 
partaking of and becoming one with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, Satan, the devil tempted man to be his own God and, and Adam, who represented us all, bit. We bit into the lie and so then we spend the rest of our lives thinking, well, I'm pretty good. They're really bad. I'm not as bad as them. I'm worse than them. And we're comparing with our, each other and we're trying to reach up to some standard that God all along has known we can't reach. And that is why he sent his son. Because without Jesus Christ, we will always fail. So I'm going to look a little closer at what sin is. What really is sin? Is it some bad choices, bad behaviors, bad habits? Or is it something much deeper? Join me in the next video and find out. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.